Welcome to Top 5, a show where we count things down from number 5 to number 1, because that's why it's called Top 5. And we got places to stay this week, <laughs> because thanks to one of you, one of you, dear listeners out there, wrote in and yep, said... No, I never keep track because I don't want somebody to say, oh, if I start saying the same person's name again and again, then su- suddenly everyone's like, oh, he's just playing favorites, huh? If I mention nobody's name, then it could be you, or it could be you, or it could be you that recommended this week that we run down our top five hero headquarters. Oh, this that is does, such a good one. That does sound like me, I'll grant you. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound anything like you. Ah, look, uh, Matthew's here, Rodrigo's here, and hey, Rodrigo is here as well. Rodrigo, why don't you... Uh... <laughs> he doesn't even realize he did it, folks. <laughs> no, I did. Why don't, we, um, why don't we start with you, Rodrigo? And then we'll okay. swing around the horn to Ashley and Matthew and then back to me. Woo! <laughs> oh, hey, it's Ashley. Yeah, it's Ashley. Um... <laughs> hey, guys. All right. So uh, my number five... Oh, critical... Oh. Yeah, my number five uh, hero headquarter. Uh, I think um, the best hero headquarters have something going for them, uh, whether that be like uh, kind of an impenetrability or, uh, in this case, mobility. Um, this is really my number five because to call the uh, the person who who stays here a hero is kind of a stretch. Is he a hero just because he's kind of shirking his duties as an evil, like, death spawn and isn't draining the blood from the living? Uh, maybe. But uh, Castle Ducula uh, from Count Ducula is really good because he, uh, it's this, like, really derelict or, like, really, like, falling apart uh, looking ancient castle that can teleport to other places. So uh, Count Ducula can have adventures outside of, I'm going to guess, Ducksylvania. Um, <laughs> that that exactly seems safe. Oh I, it's God. been a while since I've seen an episode, but I'm just going to guess that's what his uh, country is called. Um, and, uh, you know, he can go to the beach. He can go to Australia and have, like, different adventures wherever he goes. As long as there's, like, a mountain where he can put the castle, because it kind of needs to land someplace. Uh, so, yeah, my my number five, Castle Ducula. Excellent. Very good way to start things off. Ashley, let's swing over to you and see what you have on your list. So I almost put my number five as Appa from Avatar The Last Airbender, but I don't like the idea of classifying him as a thing. So mm. uh, my number five is the only headquarters that I could come up with that's in the city that I live in. So Los Angeles for being as big as it is, is not really a hotbed for secret superhero uh, get together places, mostly because it's full of poor actors. And I think there's probably something unattractive about that. But uh, the amazing soon to be Hulu series, inexplicably the runaways have a secret cave in Griffith Park, which is quite near the famous observatory uh, that you may know from such properties as Rebel Without a Cause or that one weird scene in Agent Carter where they tried to convince you that Culver <laughs> City was full of orange groves and there were way too many lights on from the 40s. Um, the thing that I like about this cave is that if I were feeling ambitious today, I could walk to it. And it feels like somewhere that a bunch of teenagers who had just left home and had no concept of the real world would actually go. Um, I like that you get to see them slowly have to figure out how to make it a functioning base, uh, how to keep a dinosaur there, how to set up some computers and store important objects. And because most of the time when the artists get really lazy, you just get a bunch of gray backgrounds, which leads to some really cool colors in the foreground. So my number five is the uh, Runaways Cave in Griffith Park. Excellent. Los Angeles, California. <laughs> Excellent. It's a good thing you uh, got to the Griffith Park part first, because I was just about to say, well, you know, in that Runaway series. You get Runaway theory, theory, theory. <laughs> Yeah. Matthew, what do you have for number five? Well, my number five dates back to 65 years ago, a time when in order to defeat the greatest and nastiest villains of all, what you really needed was a hipster douchebag with a bag of lime. And so... The Justice League of America's initial headquarters was, in fact, designed for access, I guess I should say, to that particular douchebag in the city of Happy Harbor, Rhode Island. And it was a cave on a I hill. don't have any lime. Yeah, exactly. They lived in a cave, like you do, and 
the most powerful heroes in the world. Superman, Wonder Woman, the Martian Manhunter, that one schmuck with the ring whose name I never want to say. They all hung out in a cave in Happy Harbor, and people thought this was weird. So eventually they moved into this satellite in outer space. But fortunately, in the 1990s, there was a team called Young Justice, which moved right back into that same cave and hung out there and did kind of the same thing that the the runaways did. Hung out in a cave with a robot, had sleepovers, mm-hmm. you know, poked each other, uh, wore bad wigs in the case of Wonder Girl for reasons. You really want to say poked each other on a family friendly show? On They're the shoulder. Teenagers. <laughs> on the shoulder. With their ha- Ashley. <laughs> oh, first of all, I do not use such euphemistic language. I got to get my Zach on every once in a while. <laughs> right. Right. I get you. If I were going to say that, I'd actually probably just throw an F-bomb because that's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> in any case, the secret sanctuary, a cave on a hill in Happy Harbor, Rhode Island, is my number five superhero headquarters. It's kind of damp and kind of weird and kind of squishy. And, you know, just like me. Thank you for that, Matthew. Uh, My number five (laughs) is located in New York City. It is on the 38th floor of the Empire State Building. (gasps) And if you happen to be in the 38th floor, you would have access to living quarters and uh, science rooms and more science rooms. And, of course, the all-important science rooms. (laughs) And you can take an elevator down to a secret underground garage that is full of all sorts of vehicles both large and small and there's even a tunnel that will take you out to a warehouse located on the east river i'm guessing where you can get into a plane and fly anywhere around the world providing that it's between 1932 and 1946 and your name is doc savage it's the weirdest thing they never say in the books that it's the empire state building uh that doc savage's uh, main headquarters are on but uh, they do say in the 1930s that it is the tallest building in New York City, which at the time was only the Empire State Building. So uh, there you go. That is my number five. Doc Savage and his crew living it up on the uh, 38th floor of uh, the Empire State Building and the uh, glass on. I don't know if it's the entire building or just on that floor is um, a little thicker than everything else. Because the index of refraction shifts everything off to the left slightly so that if you're trying to take a gun and shoot Doc Savage from a building across the way, you're going to miss because you're aiming at where the reflection is and not where Doc Savage is. It might be the Hudson if I remember where the. I don't remember if it's. Yeah, it's it's one of those. So Uh, I think it's the Hudson. Rodrigo, what do you have for number four? All right, number four, kind of going off of the uh, mobility idea. It's also, if you're a superhero team, you want to um, deploy to different places and you want to be able to do that, right? The way that uh, Doc Savage has tunnels and and an ability to uh, get to different parts of the city. Uh, So, too, does my number four have a way to get our heroes to where they need to go? And they do it. By firing out of firing them out of a giant gun that sits on top of their pizza restaurant. <laughs> I'm talking about Pizza Cat Restaurant from Samurai Pizza Cats. Oh my god, I can't believe in somebody fact, else in the world knows what that is. <laughs> that's right. Speedy and friends, they will uh... deliver pizza for you and also fight other robotish animals, I guess. Um and uh, and they'll do it with style. So yeah, my number four, Pizza Cat Restaurant. Excellent. Now uh, apparently you don't order pizza, or is everybody cats? Because I don't want to order a pizza and They're have it covered in, like, in fur balls. Things. They're cats. Uh, everybody. Deliver pizza. Yeah, everybody's animals. Ah, okay. So a little so, bit of hair is not. Presumably, be a big deal. yeah, you'd be some sort of like I don't know, fox or or yeah. oh, finch you. or something. Yeah. But anyway. Ashley would be a fox, I think. Stephen would be uh, like a Careful. skink or a komodo. Yeah. yeah. What? Uh, I Ashley, legit because... tried to tell Jason about that show, and I think he thought I was making it up. No, that came. That was it like it, it, it wasn't it that around like, the same time as really Ninja Turtles. Turtles. Yeah, I know. It, it got to the U.S. <laughs> I want to say in the early. We got 90s. It, yeah, we got it in the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. It. I. I want to say nineteen ninety four, maybe. 
Let's see. I don't know. Right? Well, I know the original, uh, the Japanese version is from 1990. That's literally all that I know about Samurai Pizza Cats. Yeah, it's, it's, awesome. uh, it's, it's really ridiculous. It, it really does. Um, it, imagine, so, you know, in sometimes when you watch anime, a, uh, they'll go through like serious parts and then the, a character will say something funny and everybody's like, ah, and like their heads get all weird. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, this was the, the show is just like, forget the serious part. Let's just do this. It's right, like it's transformation good. sequences, ridiculous situations, and nothing else. Very cool. <laughs> Ashley, what do you have for number four? My number four comes from TV Land, uh, where there are DC TV shows that are the kings of the airwaves, and there's one tiny little princess that we keep making kiss, a really annoying space guy. Um <laughs> My favorite show of the DC TV universe uh, is sometimes Supergirl, but is mostly Arrow. And the cool thing about Arrow is that the Arrow Cave, which is actually referred to as the Foundry in the scripts, although they never ever call it that, the original base from series one and two when it was underneath the Verdant Club before they put it in like an office building for no reason, uh, is yes. Yeah, so it's the Foundry. It is, I think, the most practical version of what a Bat Cave is. Essentially, it's a more tech savvy sort of styled down version of what we saw in the Nolan films. It has better lighting. The green lighting is dope. You have full Felicity room while there is room for both Diggle uh, and Oliver to be topless in the background, inexplicably doing salmon ladders because that's never once paid off, but 10 out of 10 put it in every episode. I just think the Foundry is one of the coolest sets I've ever seen on TV. Definitely the coolest set in the entire DC TV CW universe. And hopefully someday I'll get to write a scene there. So, yeah, I know it's derivative of like the arrow cave that he has in the comics, but there's something about seeing it realized even on the small screen that is just really cool. And he stole the arrow cave from Batman anyway. You know. Right. Made off with, with it in the middle of the night. Yeah. He did. He was just like, duh, 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 well, duh, duh. it's okay. They, they stole like the whole yeah, third season from Batman Begins. Even Russell Cool shows up. Well, in the fifties, Green Arrow was literally Batman with a bow and arrow, so yeah. it's legit. It's it's historical. It's cool. I'm down. I love the Foundry. Matthew, Matthew, what do you have for number four? My number four, much like Rodrigo's, is mobile, but not in the same way, because it doesn't actually move. It's just that it's been in New York City, and it's been in San Francisco, and it's even been in a little town we call Jump City, but it's always on an island in the river. And it's always structurally unsound because it's shaped like a letter T, which means it's a tower with another tower across the top. And you'd think that when you get out to those edges, there's going to be some wobbly issues. Fortunately, it was designed and built initially by super genius Dr. Silas Stone, whose son Victor uh, was in a terrible accident, lost his arms and legs and half of his face, and had them all replaced with steel and became the superhero known as Cyborg. Some people will tell you he's a founding member of the Justice League of America. Those people are liars. They are liars and cheats, and they want to take your childhood and beat it up and steal its lunch money and take all the Tootsie Rolls, and they want to yell at you, but don't let them do it. Victor Stone was a teen titan. And Titan's Tower uh, actually at one point was completely destroyed. It, it happens. Um, yeah. It turns out one of the girls that live there has a demon for a dad. He has temper issues. And it was replaced by another Titan's Tower that was actually an underground complex with a holographic T on top. So as to confuse and frighten you into attacking upward and give the Titans underneath a chance to come up and then fight your face. Um, and at one point it was in fact transformed entirely into gingerbread and frosting. But, uh, you know, the teen Titans go cartoon is somewhat loose with its continuity. So that may or may not have actually happened. I, I don't know. Every time that show comes on, I just, my eyes slowly glaze over and I start listing the names of the Legion of superheroes and joining order. But in any case, Titans tower, the headquarters of many different versions of the teen Titans, the Titans, I think they had another name somewhere along the line. But nonetheless, it's a giant T-shaped building in the middle of the river 
which is in no way just asking somebody to come flying down like a giant demon and smash your house. Very cool. Uh, my number four is um, an island, and it has beaches that you can run on with your friends. It's got a, a place where you can fly your airplane in and out of. It's got yeah. living quarters. It's got gymnasiums. It's got target ranges. It's got rooms for doing science and more rooms for doing science and even more rooms for doing science. Sad thing is you rarely get to see uh, Palm Key Island in uh, the Florida Keys because Johnny Quest and his friends and family are always flying all over the globe uh, to have some crazy adventures. But if you watch the intro to Johnny Quest, you'll always see their main headquarters in Palm Key Island. My number four, Johnny Quest's home for him, Haji, Race, Dr. Quest, and of course the dog. Bandit. Bandit. Because he and has the dog. <laughs> yes, the dog. <laughs> the dog. Steven doesn't care about the dog. He also doesn't remember that Dr. Quest's first name was Benton. No, it's always Dr. Quest. If you're someone like Race, you're very polite to your employer. You always call him Dr. Quest. Yeah, it's someone it. evil. Race it's Nathan someone evil who Nathan has Nathan. no uh, no uh, um, uh, care for Dr. West or yeah, Dr. Uh, Quest. That would call him by his first name. The evil Dr. Zinn would be ben. like Benton. Exactly. Let oh, us move on. Let us move on to our number threes. And Rodrigo, what do you have for number three? Uh, my number three has um, it, it's it's like I think it's important that a that a hero uh, headquarters, uh, if it's going to be visible, it has to be kind of ridiculously visible. Titan's Tower, I think, is a great example of like, well, this could just be a tower, but let's just go ahead and make it a T so they know who lives here. Um, so my number three is another cat themed um, place to hang out. And that's the Cat's Lair from Thundercats, which is just a giant cat. It's just an enormous, <laughs> ridiculous cat that the Thundercats live in. And uh, if I recall, it was made out of the parts that they from their crashed. I want to say also cat shaped ship. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the Thundercats That's are big branding. into that, and it's it's really crazy. That's the thing that I've never understood is like, okay, they're like Thundercats are cat people. They're like, but are they are there actual cats that they're like? We are like these guys because you know, like you have like Snarf who's like a cat lizard. But it's like right. there have to be like act also actual cats, right? Otherwise, yeah. how do they know what a cat looks like? Why isn't the the little logo that appears from the Sword of Omens like a uh, like just Lionel's head, like with like right. two like throwing up like two thumbs up or something like that, right? You have to think of it like Ross from Friends mm -hmm. had a smaller primate as a pet. Uh, you feel you feel like you know a, a cat, a pet cat, or a domestic cat would be the equivalent of having like a macaque or or a spider monkey. Yeah, kind of like how Goofy and pet. Pluto are um, two different things. Yeah, you know, that, they're the same. Goofy, Goofy's a dog. Pluto's a pet dog. That that does explain it. Uh, really, so yeah, my my number three, the Cat Slayer from Thundercats. Excellent. Sounds like a really cool underground speakeasy. Yeah. Come on down to the Cat Slayer. See, this is my new friend Jackie the Blade. By the way, not a lot of uh, solid Thundercats uh, wikis out there. So, yeah. like, if you want to play a fun game that'll just take you a few minutes, um, Google Cats Lair Thundercats and play a game of where does the apostrophe go? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Ashley, what do you have for number three? Uh, my number three was originally going to be Happy Harbor, but Matthew stole that. So oh, snap. Uh, I am going to change it this very second and I am going to make it uh, Tim Drake's Robin's Nest, which mm -hmm. is introduced, I believe, in the Red Robin solo series yeah. that Francis Manipole drew really cool. Is that, his where is that his warehouse space? It is. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a ripoff of the little warehouse space that Nightwing has in his Chuck Dixon solo series some 15 years previous, <laughs> but I like Tim Drake better, so this is what we're talking about. What I like about it is that even though he's still mostly operating in and around Gotham, except he goes to Chicago, I think, for like a hot second and then travels around the world for the rest of the series, if uh, any member of the Bat family is going to be based somewhere other than 
either the clock tower or the bat cave i think tim makes the most sense because although he's the most like batman he's also the one who operates the most independently we all like to pretend that it's dick grayson and that because he's an adult now he has beef with bruce but ultimately he still works very closely as either an agent of batman or he's off in bloodhaven again to fulfill like the emotional <laughs> quest that batman has sent him on while he's finding himself um I think the idea of the Robin's nest is really cool. I think it looks really good. Uh, it also is something that defines Tim in his role as Robin or red Robin. And he was the first Robin to have the red bird, which is the motorcycle. So you need somewhere dope to steal your red bird. So you gotta have, you gotta have a Robin's nest and yeah, I like the Robin's nest. Very the cool. <laughs> it's also much easier to blow up if you're trying to kill Robin. It's very true. That's true. Yeah. If you don't so have a headquarters, sad. they can't blow you up. It's the law. Yeah. Well, at least his is not shaped like a T. It's sitting out in the middle of the bay for everyone. <laughs> well, no, of course not. His would be shaped like an R. Also structurally unsound. Well, on the plus side, it took them a long time to find out where his warehouse headquarters were because everyone kept running to these restaurants and bursting and going, we've got you now, Red Robin. Oh, wait. Yeah. Uh, nope. uh, Matthew, what do you have for number three? My number three was suggested by the widget, uh, as often happens when I'm trying to think about shows, uh, we will come home. I get home from work. She gets home from school and I'll be like, rah, 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 some, rah, some. cause you know, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in the 1970s in Kansas, which is really a way of saying that I grew up in the 1960s. That was and, the dust bowl, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the 1960s, boys life magazine had a series of short stories that they published about a group of kids who hung out together and had heroic adventures using real science and the power of being a Boy Scout. Gallant and Goofus? No, it was not no. Gallant and Goofus. These seven boys, Jeff, Henry, Dinky, Freddy, Homer, Mortimer, and Charlie. Uh, Charlie never gets mentioned because Charlie narrates the series in first person. So if you didn't know there was a Charlie, you're welcome. All collectively were known as the mad scientists club. And this was a weird kind of boys adventure series where everything was relatively realistic. And the things that they did were based on real science and real technology of the 1960s. And they hung out in Jeff Crocker's barn, which is behind his parents' house. And they had special little things set up to where you couldn't get in or out of the barn without triggering an electric beam. And everyone would know it would set off an alarm. They had gadgets and gizmos all around the place. And the best part of all was in order to get the cash box for the, uh, the uh, club's membership, you had to flip three different switches, have somebody crawl up across a roof beam, flip down a ladder so someone else could climb up to where the switch was to drop it down. Because one of their former members, a boy named Harmon Muldoon, wanted to steal all their money and all their secrets and make them look bad. Nonetheless, the Mad Scientist Club would hang out in this barn. And sometimes they'd just be there hanging out, doing stuff, building ham radios, whatever kids in the 60s did. I don't know. Uh, smoking weird stuff. No way. That was a different part of the 60s. But the fact remains that to this day, I remember parts of those stories by heart like word for word verbatim. So when I read them to widget a few years ago, when she was younger, I could remember these things and I told her about them and she'd be like, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? So for a while, this was our thing. The mad scientist club was totally our thing. So she said, I had to have this in the show or else she would disown me. And that's why my number three is Jeff Crocker's barn the headquarters of the heroic mad scientist club. Little does she know she only has five more years before she can just legally disown you. Shut up. <laughs> Can't you do that at 16 in certain states? If you become emancipated? No, Kansas is weird. You Kansas can't do anything weird. in Kansas. No, you can't. <laughs> Which is why we're now to my number three. If you are a member of a superhero team, eh, hero team, you need science rooms. <laughs> you need science rooms, but sometimes your fellow team members may be just a little bit too much and you need to get away. So you fly up to the North Pole and you hang out in solitude where you can meditate, you can contemplate, you can work in your science rooms. <laughs> your dear girlfriend, Claire Reese can come around and you can play the reindeer games with all your friends. 
I, I, is, this may be a different North Pole. No, it's not not the North Pole, Matthew. I'm okay. I'm talking about the Fortress of Solitude. Oh, you know the place where Doc Savage goes when he needs to be alone. <laughs> Predating nice. Superman's Fortress of Solitude by years, uh, Doc <laughs> Savage's Fortress of Solitude is a place where he can go and do all of those things that you need to do when uh, you need to be away from all your friends because they're aggravating you. My number three, <laughs> Doc Savage's Fortress of Solitude. I don't understand why you would think about your friends aggravating you. I, I don't. I'm just saying this is, I think, what happens to Doc Savage. You know, Monk oh, and okay. Ham, they start going off and it's just like, come on, guys, stop it with the bickering constantly or I'm going to fly to Seattle so I can get away from you too. Uh, oh, Rodrigo, let's get to our number twos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do all of that. <laughs> I don't know what any of that meant. All right. So number two, there is a really really fantastic show that has basically been lost to time only very few people ever saw it even fewer remember it but it was great this show has come up before on top five because who wouldn't want their best friend to be like a cyborg horse who also just turns into a regular horse <laughs> um and who wouldn't want to have all the powers of really just a bunch of like kind of mundane animals? Um, I'm talking, of course, about uh, Brave Star, a show about a space cowboy and his horse friend. Um, so uh, in Brave Star, there's the place where they operate is called uh, Fort Carrium, and um, there's a town around it. And when the bad guys show up, they start pulling levers and the whole town just like uh, co like gets pulled like all these like pistons and like shafts come out and they like grab onto like the, the grocery store and the schoolhouse and the armory. And they actually physically pull them into the fort, thus like fortifying the entire town against uh, attackers. Um, it is ridiculous. <laughs> um but i remember this like from watching it as a kid and i think even as a child i was like that is ridiculous but it's so cool you know I i've seen so many shows where um they're like oh no we need to protect the populace and like maybe a, like a force field comes up or you know or the, the the heroes just go out there and 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 do it by hand um but this idea of like just condensing the entire town into a fortress uh i've i've always found to be great and and you don't see it very often um there are really i was trying to think of more examples of something like that happening um and other than you know maybe things with like vehicles coalescing into a single thing you don't really see that mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you don't really see that too much so uh fort Kirium from uh brave star a uh, gem of of animation um, yeah. unsung heroes of being a Top cyber of the course. filmation heap as far as I'm concerned. Pretty much, yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, Ashley, this brings us back around to you for your number yeah. two. My number two uh, is a Marvel Comics property that everyone became really familiar with when Benedict's cover batch uh, started the movie last year. So I'm obviously talking about the Sanctum Sanctorum uh, known as Doctor Strange's headquarters, that's not actually tied back to all of the magicy, magicy people. Although I guess now it is in the movies. Uh, I know a bunch of you are saying, "Oh, but that's Doctor Strange's house, and that doesn't count because it's a public address." But there was an Avengers team that use it as their headquarters. The so Defenders totally did for years too. Does yes, it totally does count. Uh, sometimes in some continuities, it can make itself invisible. It is not an actual address that exists on Bleecker Street, but it looks really cool in that uh, turn-of-the-century New York architectural style. It has the very best glass, um, what do you call those, skylights that mm -hmm. I've ever, ever seen. And every time you go inside, it looks slightly different and slightly more like the key house for Block and Key. Plus, there's a good chance that you could die if you walked around the same corner 
or the wrong <laughs> corner is what I actually meant to say. So there's that element of fun to it as well. And I just think the Sanctum Sanctorum is criminally underrated. And because it it's never been the public face of a team, like when I was making my list, I said, well, Titans Tower can't count because everybody knows the Teen Titans live there. And the X-Men can't count because everyone knows the X-Men live there. Um, but the Sanctum Sanctorum can't count because nobody who's not a hero knows that Doctor Strange lives there. And it housed the super team. Plus, looks great in the movies. You know, in the... Um... In the in a couple of like the Spider-Man video games that had like more of a like Grand Theft Auto sandbox kind of thing, you could go you could go to like visit the Sanctum Sanctorum, the Baxter Stop Building, it. and and the Latverian Embassy. What? Right. Yep. What the fork? That's amazing. Yeah, it's like they they like uh, replicated you know Manhattan as closely as possible, except they added at least those three crazy landmarks. Oh, that is so nice. cool. Matthew, what do you have for number two? My number two is awesome. Flat out, just amazing. In days past, the Red Pirate Gang actually used it as their floating headquarters and home. But the Red Pirates were nearly wiped out by an evil, evil dude named Bosco. And so the last of the Red Pirates set off on a quest to find the ultimate treasure in the universe. And along the way, he found the power of Super Sentai. And so, gathering a team of multicolored children around him, Gokai Red and his Gokai Galleon, which is a giant flying pirate ship in which he and his team lives, that also doubles as their giant robot in times of trouble, sort of float about the universe, having adventures, fighting people. And I think that the real genius of this is when you are in between sequences, your your characters need to have a place to hang out. This is literally a mm -hmm. set that they use. It's a room. It's got a living room and chairs and tables and a kitchen. And then you have to ask yourself, when it turns into a giant robot, what happens to all their furniture and dishes and personal stuff? But you can't ask yourself that. You know why? Because that way lies madness. So the Gokai Galleon is this giant flying pirate ship. And if you need any more argument than that, it's red. And that, my friends, is why it's my number two. One of the greatest superhero headquarters of all time. So it's a giant pirate ship. Do they have a little robot sidekick run around, but instead of saying I, 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 he goes R, R, R. Actually, oh, he, could say, he could say I, I, I. I mean, that is also <laughs> a, like a nautical thing. He's a parrot. Or she's oh, a parrot. Okay. And she tends to run around and have psychic visions of the future Where and bang her head on things. Oh. Mm. All yes. right. My number two is a place that this hero can go to when he needs to get away from his other friends. <laughs> and he needs to do lots of science. And this place stores all of his cool things like cars and boats and planes Problem is, you got a real guano problem all over the place. I'm talking about the Bat Cave, my number two, the place where Batman goes to do science. Because that's what he science. does. Science! Yes, see, thank you. Rodrigo, let us now move us into our number ones. Right. So, uh, my number one has... Um, Pretty much has most of the traits that that we've talked about in um, in a headquarter that you'd want in a headquarters. Uh, it is very difficult to attack. Um, it allows you to or allows the heroes to deploy out um, out of it, um, and it comes with a helpful mentor type person, um, which I, I think a lot of these uh, do as well. Um, and uh, I'm talking, of course, about the end of time from uh, Chrono Trigger. So Chrono Trigger is a video game about time-traveling teenagers and robots and frogs and cavemen. Um, and their adventures as they try to stop a great evil, as you often do in video games. Um, and they're time travelers. So they accidentally end at basically the last moment in time which has an old guy in it and is basically just like a bunch of driftwood out in nothingness. Um, 
And they just, you know, nobody's ever going to show up there. So they just kind of use it as a headquarters. And then from there on out, your your party loadout is basically at the end of time. Um, you know, like everything, everything has already happened. So there's no real danger of anybody showing up and messing with your stuff. Uh, so you can just uh, time travel freely once you go from there. It's uh, it's really interesting conceptually, I've always thought. Um, it's also really bleak because according to this game, there is an end of time and it basically looks like four planks of wood. Meanwhile, so, uh, yeah. at the end of time... Yep. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, dun, dun, dun. My, uh, my number one uh, as far as a uh, super cool hero headquarters is the end of time from Chrono Trigger. That is pretty cool. Ashley, this brings us to your number one. Yes. Uh, my number one is Oracle's Clock Tower because okay. Oracle is one of the greatest comic book characters of all time. And I say it every time I bring her up and I'll say it again. Uh, it's a really powerful move on DC's behalf to take a character who is not only female but disabled and make her like the smartest person in the universe who, you know, feeds tips to the Justice League. And she does it all through the power of her amazing brain and from this weird clock tower that looks a lot like it does when it pops up in Smallville. It's also the secret headquarters of the Birds of Prey during the uh, Chuck Dixon run. I brought up Chuck Dixon a lot this episode, but it's because everything he wrote in the 90s was amazing. Uh, and is my favorite thing about comics in the whole wide world. Also, if you are a fan of the uh, Batman family crossover event known as No Man's Land, uh, it features very prominently in there and remains a stronghold. Until it was wiped from continuity, it was one of the most important not only features of the DC universe, but of Gotham specifically, you could see it a lot in the skyline. And once you sort of knew what it was, you you, you just always see it there. And that was really cool. Uh, a lot of green on the inside, not unlike the foundry slash arrow cave, which I'm obviously a great fan of. And I just really like Barbara Gordon. And I like the idea that she has her own space that is uh, equally, if not more important than the bat cave. So the clock tower. There you go. Matthew, this brings us to your number one. My can number you, one. Can you beat a flying um, pirate ship? Sure. Okay, do it. Come with me, friends, family, Rodrigo, to the year 3058. Better yet, 3958. Who knows? It's sometime in the far, far future. The planet is Fwang. Planet Fwang is constantly under siege by meteorite storms from outer space. Rocks constantly flying down to the planet. And so, as often happens, the natives of Planet Fwang have developed a special defense against meteorite storms. All male children on Planet Fwang, upon achieving puberty... Discover the ability to transform into giant metallic fortresses. Now, one boy, one fwanging boy, left his home planet in search of adventure. And he came to the very first tryouts of the Legion of Superheroes. And that fwangian boy, calling himself Fortress Lad, showed off his powers just as the Legion was under attack by a terrible villain named Mnemonic Kid, who was ready to wipe away their memories and take the Legion out. But Fortress Lad used his power to turn into a metallic fortress, a yellow metallic fortress with red fins around the top to save the Legionnaires at the cost of his own memory and mind. Forgetting that he was ever a boy from Fwang, he thus he became the Legion Clubhouse. And that, my friends, is my number one. It's an upside-down rocket ship that's secretly a boy who transforms into an upside-down rocket ship. It's mm -hmm. bigger on the inside. Has to be bigger on the inside because you're inside of a living being and that's creepy as all get out. But more importantly, all the kids from the future, when they're not hanging out at the ice cream shop or going to sock hops or flying around the city, fighting their own evil brothers. They come home to what was once Fortress Lad, and they know that they are safe. They are completely protected from meteorite storms. Um, not from much of anything else, but meteorite storms are taken care of. 
My number one, the Legion Clubhouse, formerly known as Fortress Lad of Planet Fuang. Salute. There you go. I don't know if I can top that one, but I will try. Once upon a time, there was a very rich man, probably the richest man in all of comicdom. How rich was he, do you ask? How rich was he? He was so rich that when a team of superheroes needed a new headquarters, he said, I will fund your space headquarters floating high above Earth. That may be a weapon that can go out of control and thus throw the entire world's trust of us into question. And there will be spaces that people can work out and people can relax People can do science, although there's never much science being done on this place that I've ever seen. We can lock up our bad guys here, and we can gaze down upon the puny humans, (laughs) for we are gods. This is the Justice League Unlimited, the Watchtower. God, yeah. The cool thing about the Watchtower, beyond all that other stuff, is the fact that it is so big that How big was it? it is so big that you have to have a public workforce come up to your watchtower to do like toilet cleaning and bed mm-hmm. changing and stuff. And in order for those people to get up to the watchtower, they have to go to like a secret cornfield in Nebraska and get beamed up. Sure. That is how awesome. Well, the, the cool thing about the watchtower, at least up until they had the accident where the uh, laser almost split the earth in two. Was that? Thanks, Gail Simone. Yeah, uh, they actually had like a civilian workforce that they were beaming up that were doing all the menial tasks that you would, you know, some people may never think. Oh, hey, we need somebody to unload these crates of food so that we can eat. That's what those people are for. And I always thought that that was so cool. And then, of course, uh, the the fact that Bruce Wayne funded it all uh, for sure. is uh, is also <clears throat> kind of cool. But uh, embezzling money from his various pursuits. <laughs> yes, from his various pursuits. Uh, but I always thought just the idea that, you know, you could start as somebody who is like, I'm just out of college. I'm going to go work for the Justice League in space. I always thought that was kind of cool. So Justice League Watchtower. Um, All right. I think that wraps it up for this installment of Top 5. I think you, the audience, know what to do next. Head over to Majorspoilers.com. In the comments section for this episode, share your Top 5 Hero Headquarters. Tell us where it is, why it's cool, and why it's on your list. And we're all going to read it. Why? Because everyone loves a list. We'll talk with you real soon. This podcast is copyright 2017 by Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC.